Welcome to the Putback on SNY.TV. I'm Ian Begley here with Chris Williamson, who starts us off with the baseline. That's right, Ian. And the Knicks finished up their seven game road trip going three and four. And while there are some easier opponents coming up, it certainly feels like the Knicks' playoff chances have faded away. So, what is the direction of this team with 14 games to go? Chris, maybe they try to win every night and, and try to pull off a miracle and, and get into the playing tournament. But as you said, the odds there are slim. So I would expect at some point that you pivot towards playing the young players more often, players like Miles McBride and Obi Toppin, because you want to see more from your young players to get a chance to f further evaluate them. And I would suspect that Tom Thibodeau would make that move uh, once it is crystal clear that they're out of the playoffs. What do you believe is going to happen with Tom Thibodeau. His future um, is definitely an interesting one based on how the season has gone. Yeah, I think, Chris, part of the answer to that is what do the Knicks want to do big picture with this roster? Because let's say they say, hey, we want to go young, we want to lean into our young guys, and we want to try to build out this young core and more slowly build things towards uh, contention. Then I would suspect that you look at Tom Thibodeau and you say, hey, he did he did some good things, did some not so great things in terms of developing these young guys. Is he uh, the right guy for this team going forward? I don't think Jim Dolan would get in the way of any decision that uh, Leon Rose and William Wesley made on Tom Thibodeau. He has, I think, three years left on his deal after this one. I know that, as we reported, uh, there were some influential people at MSG who had lost confidence in Thibodeau prior to the All-Star break when the Knicks were struggling. Um, and also, we know that, that William Wesley had, you know, talked to owner James Dolan over the course of the season uh, about the Knicks' struggles and, and cited Thibodeau's coaching as, as part of the struggles. I think what's key, uh, some of the Knicks haven't had is stability uh, at the head coaching position. So you obviously want things to be uh, tightened up. If the Knicks were to, per se, move on from him, what type of coach would they be looking for? Yeah, I think, Chris, it depends on the direction of this offseason, but I, I would assume that uh, part of it is about player development. You know, Kenny Atkinson uh, had fans in the organization during that last coaching search. Not to say that Tom Thibodeau um, has done a poor job developing young players. I, I would push back on that a little bit because you look at Quentin Grimes, you look at R.J. Barrett, but also, Chris, in a bigger picture sense, you know, if Leon Rose uh, were to let Tom Thibodeau go this offseason, you know, this was Thibodeau was Leon Rose's handpicked coach, and it would be uh, another instance of, you know, lack of stability. So you want to say Tom Thibodeau should lose his job. I think you have to think long and hard about what that means from a big picture perspective. And I was talking to uh, a, a veteran coach, longtime coach, ex-coach, who has won in the league, has lost in the league. And, and he was saying that, you know, the, the idea that the front office uh, let's a coach go. Obviously, it happens all the time, but in, in a perfect world, you know, these guys are held accountable together because they came in together. So if you're saying the coach should get let go, you know, what does that say about the front office? He was speaking kind of from an ownership perspective and specifically to New York, the coach was saying, just, you know, how many times has this happened before? Would this just be same old Knicks if they do turn the coach over and, and get the next coach and, and try to make that work? He just he saw it as a pattern that it would be repeating itself again. So just a couple factors to think about um, as we move forward here with the rest of the season and with Tom Thibodeau and how he gets analyzed. One standout of the Knicks youth movement is second round pick Miles McBride, proving already to be a defensive force. The rookie posted a plus 13 Sunday in Brooklyn, despite scoring zero points. His trainer, Juwan Staten, has worked with McBride since his days at West Virginia. He's extremely dedicated. I think that's why he's had so many strides um, in his game. He's been able to add so many things just because he, he works relentlessly. I mean, from the time I met him um, and started working with him at WVU, he wanted to go at it every day. Staten has primarily worked with McBride on his ball handling skills, but has been surprised by some of the other developments in his offensive game. Some of the reads that he makes um, off ball screens, we didn't really have like a lob a lob pass man at, at West Virginia the year that he was playing. Um, but just seeing him and Jericho Sims and that type of chemistry that they build and all the lobs he's throwing him is something that I've really picked up on. One aspect of his scoring that has really stood out to me and others is the right-hander's ability to go to his left. Something else Stan has taken note of. At West Virginia, he was more of a 
a three-point shooter and a pull-up guy. He didn't really finish at the rim as much as he's doing now. So that's something I picked up on. And also just creating moves and creating moves off the dribble into his shot. He just seems way more confident, making a lot more moves with the ball. Staten believes that he'll work with McBride on his pacing this offseason, as well as adapting more to the point guard role in the association. And I think his time is coming. I think we've been preparing well. I think he's been preparing well on his own. And I think his hunger is the biggest thing that's going to take him forward. So we're just going to continue to work on the things that, that we know we need to work on. But I think he'll be ready just because he's so ready for that opportunity. And leading the way for the Knicks in the plus minus category on Sunday in Brooklyn was Jericho Sims with six points and 10 boards. And it was actually his third game with 10 or more boards since the All-Star break. So as you look at Jericho Sims, um, is this second round pick emerging as a true potential piece for this franchise? Yeah, I think, Chris, if you look at that center situation, that's a question the Knicks are trying to answer with Sims getting these minutes. Mitchell Robinson, obviously unrestricted free agent this offseason. Uh, several teams will have interest in him and, and I think will come at him uh, aggressively. You then you have Taj Gibson, excuse me, uh, option for next season. Uh, and then Nerlens Noel uh, has been in and out of the lineup with injury. So there's a lot in flux there at the center position. I think that's one of the reasons you're seeing uh, Jericho Sims get significant minutes. And if you listen to Tom Thibodeau, uh, Sims has done well with the minutes that he's got. Obviously, he makes mistakes. That's what happens when you're a rookie. Uh, but by and large, I think he's succeeded in his role here, and he showed the Knicks something. I mean, you look at that game Sunday uh, against the Nets and Kevin Durant, the Knicks were sending two at Durant late in the fourth quarter. And oftentimes, uh, that second defender was Jericho Sims. So that tells you a little bit about what the Knicks think about his athleticism, his ability uh, to get out on the perimeter and still maintain integrity uh, around the rim. And Tom Thibodeau said after that game that he felt Sims did well. A lot of positives for Jericho Sims right now. And it's interesting when you look at the bigger context of the Knicks center position and, and the uncertainty there. You have the contract of Kimball Walker. Walker currently not with the team, uh, regaining strength and, and preparing for next season. Uh, but his contract is going to be expiring going into next year. And that's always something that makes uh, a contract and a player attractive on the trade market. His deal will be expiring and there was interest in Burks at the deadline. Uh, but the thing that that was, he had that extra year on his deal. Uh, he won't have that uh, when you get into the off season. Fournier, you know, the Knicks, had talked to teams uh, prior to the deadline about potential Fournier deals. Obviously, nothing came to fruition. He's under contract uh, for three more years, the so final year being uh, a team option. So that that factors in, I think, to any potential Fournier trades. But I would say this, that he shot the ball pretty, pretty well uh, over the course of the season. Obviously, some early season struggles, but uh, more recently, I shot it pretty well. So I just wonder uh, what that means going forward in terms of the Knicks deciding, you know, he's off the table, we're not going to move him, we want him here, or increasing his trade value uh, in an offseason where, you know, the Knicks do have a lot of questions to answer. But one of the things that I'm interested in is obviously we can talk about the draft and, you know, free agency, all that, but um, are there any stars in particular that we should keep our eye on who could potentially uh, come to New York? Well, you're always going to keep an eye on Damian Lillard. And I know that, you know, he has said publicly that he's not going anywhere. And the Blazers have said that they plan to build the roster around Lillard. But uh, in, until that next deal is, is sorted out with regards to potential extension and, and his next contract, teams are going to be keeping an eye on that situation. You know, Donovan Mitchell, there's been so many rumors, reported rumors about, um, you know, if Utah doesn't fare well in the postseason, what happens? Uh, that's another situation that teams are keeping an eye on. And I would assume that the Knicks are keeping an eye on that as well because of the ties between uh, Mitchell and the organization, Leon Rose, uh, CAA, uh, Donovan Mitchell being a CAA player, uh, Johnny Bryant, associate head coach, very close with Donovan Mitchell. Um, so there's every reason in the world for them to at least keep an eye on that scenario. Uh, and so those are a couple of names to keep an eye out for. But when you talk about, you know, making these trades, making these big trades, let's say a player like Donovan Mitchell does ask out of Utah, which obviously we're not there there yet, but let's say he did. I think there would be a lot of teams interested. And I, and I wonder 
where the Knicks offer would rank in terms of strongest offer, weakest offer, somewhere in between, in terms of the teams that would have interest in Donovan Mitchell, because Utah, you know, would, would kind of be able to determine exactly where Mitchell goes. It's not like he's going to be a free agent. So that's just something worth noting there. Our thanks to Juwan Staten. For Chris, I'm Ian. We'll be back with a live episode of The Putback next week, and we'll see you then.